Hi everybody, welcome to this session. Today I want to sh explain you how to apply big data analytics and machine learning to real-time processing. We have heard a lot about that already in the keynotes and I think it's a very hot topic. And today I want to show you in the next 30 minutes the two steps of doing that. So there really is always two steps. The first step is to find patterns using machine learning in historical data sets and then afterwards applying that to real-time processing. And I will today show you both steps and also a little bit of live demo so that you see how um, people do that in real projects. That's basically the two goals of the, of the talk. And before that, let's begin with a short motivation of um, different use cases. Because we see machine learning more and more in many different industries. And that's really doesn't matter it's coming from finance or from telco or retailer. So we see machine learning really everywhere. And a few examples. Um, for example, if you want to do fraud detection, you need to do that immediately, when, before the payment is done. So really, before the transaction is done, you have to decide, is it fraud or is it not fraud? The same, for example, if you want to cross-sell something to a customer in a retailing store. You want to sell it before the customer has left the store, because after he's left the store, it's too late. Um, he was going somewhere else to buy it. So you, and you want to help machine learning to uh, analytic models to apply them here, to make the best decisions to which coupon do you will send to, to which customer, for example. Another example, um, here it was always about windows of opportunity for a few seconds where you have to decide quickly. Often you have more time. For example, we see a lot about machine learning in um, predictive maintenance where you decide if you want to replace a machine, a part in a machine before it breaks and therefore um, you have more time, sometimes even hours for that. So there's different use cases where critical business moments and you have to decide and machine learning can help you there. That's basically the motivation we see in many, many industries. And for that, let's take a look at the agenda for the next 30 minutes. First, I want to give a very short overview about what machine learning is. We have heard about that in the keynotes and so on, but that we have the same understanding. And then I will explain how to build an analytic model using machine learning. That's the first step. And then the second step, apply that to real-time processing. Because you only have a benefit when you really apply your insights and patterns later to real new events. Because otherwise, just knowing why fraud happened in the past or why a machine broke, that doesn't help. You have to apply to future events in real time to be proactive with that. With that, let's begin with a short explanation of what is machine learning. And this picture which you see here, I think that's a perfect description of that. So in the end, machine learning helps you find hidden insights without being explicitly programmed. And that means, I mean, I come from the Java perspective. I was a Java developer, developer for a long time. And um, we wrote a lot of if-else um, clauses and conditions and for loops and so on. So we explicitly program everything. For example, if you want to do a bank, bank transaction or build a web store or something like this, we def exactly define what we want to build. And now with all these big data sets, we cannot do that anymore. And therefore, we want to leverage machine learning so that the computer by itself understands the patterns in historical data so that you can leverage that. That's basically the definition. And um, let's take a look at a few real-world examples everybody of us knows to see how much power machine learning gets in the meantime. Before then, I will show you how we realize that in projects. The first example, and we know that pretty good, is spam detection. We know that for 20 years, and we also see, if you think about Yahoo or Google or whatever mail provider you use, it's getting better and better. And what's happening there? Behind the scenes, vendors like Google, they analyze all the historical data sets and send the computer on top of that. They have the machine running and analyzing the data to find out what is spam and what is not spam. And machine learning is leveraged here to compute that and decide that. And important for machine learning, it's always about probabilities. Because you never can be 100% sure, but for 99.9% .9 you can be sure in spam often. And that's getting in better, and, and on the back-end servers, there's machine learning to help you with that. Because you cannot program spam detection with if-else. If you want to write an if-else for every specific spam, that's not possible because there are so many options. And therefore, the computer has to learn what is spam with a specific probability. And the stories are getting more and more powerful. So if you think about uh, search engines like Google or Bing, 
Um, today, if you search for it, you get a specific result for what uh, Google knows about you. So they analyze all the historical data about you to give you the best recommendations and also the best advertisements so they can make more money with you. And therefore, in the end, in the background again, machine learning is analyzing the big data sets to make the best recommendations to you, but specifically to you. Your friend might get some other recommendations than you, so it's really context specific. And again, you cannot program that with if else. The computer has to learn that with machine learning algorithms. However, that is not where it stopped. So if today, if you upload a picture to Facebook, it already asks you, if you upload a picture with you and a few friends, is this friend your girlfriend? And then you click on yes, it is, or it is not. And with this, Facebook is learning again. And that's what we heard also in the keynote about deep learning. Now that's getting much, much more powerful. It's more compute intensive, but also more powerful. And Facebook also will, in the future, analyze not just who you're talking to, but also, for example, what products you're using, what beer do you drink, or at which location are you at the moment. And based on that, they can make better predictions to make better recommendations. And in the end, they earn more money with that because they give better advertisements to you. And finally, around, I think, half a year ago or so, we saw an announcement by Google, and they had a cool announcement that um, their machines beat a Go player, a professional Go player. Go, that's a, a board game, but it's much more complex than chess. And Google programmed a machine learning model um, to beat this player with that. And therefore, this shows a little bit of history of machine learning on a few real-world examples to see that it's getting much more powerful. And that, on the other side, we also have to say, what we see here, that's the tech giants usually. So that's problems they had a lot of years ago, and now the enterprises want to leverage that. You and your projects now also can leverage machine learning. And I just was in another talk about TensorFlow, and the great thing is that when Google and the other tech giants are learning these things, they open source it so that everybody can leverage it in their projects. And that's, in the end, what we are doing with our customers. And in the next 25 minutes or so, I want to show you how you can build these machine learning models by yourself with specific frameworks, and then how to deploy that to real-time processing. And for that, what you will see um, a few times during the session is a, is a slide where I show the three steps of developing such an analytic model and deploying it. The first step is visual analytics, where you take a look at historical data to do measurements and diagnosis of data. You always have to understand your data to use machine learning and leverage that in the right way. That's usually done by a business user or a subject matter expert who understands his data. Otherwise, you cannot leverage it and cannot use machine learning for that. The second step then, and because the business user alone cannot solve all the problems, because it's complex data, unstructured data, big data sets, and therefore you use things like advanced analytics or machine learning to build things like predictions and optimizations. That's the analytic model you leverage later. And so the first role is the business user, the second one is the so-called data scientist, someone with experience in mathematics and statistics and programming. And then after you have built the model, and that's really the key part, you want to deploy the same model to real-time processing because you have to leverage for, for your use cases to detect fraud before it happened, to cross-sell to a customer before he left the store, or to replace a thing in a machine before it breaks. That's the key um, steps you have to do for building and deploying uh, machine learning. And therefore, let's take a look how to do that. It's two steps. It's build the analytic model and then deploy that. So let's first take a look at how to build an analytic model. And that's an analytical pipeline. And no matter which technologies you use, it's always the same steps you have to do. And um, here, let's shortly go through the steps. And with that, again, to our, um, to our pipeline of what we do, the beginning is the business user, usually. He takes a look at the data you want to analyze. And therefore, the first step in this pipeline is data acquisition. You need to get access to your data. That's often always the first tough step to get all the data you want from your machines or from whatever you want to analyze. And uh, another issue is that usually it looks like something like this in most enterprises. You have many different data sources, um, legacy systems like a host or mainframe, Hadoop, data warehouse, CSV files, all of that. And one key lesson learned from our projects until now is that usually if you want to leverage machine learning and add value to your projects, you have to combine the different data sources. So for example, you have to combine the information of your customer relationship management system where you have your knowledge about the 
the customer with address and bank data and so on, and combine that with social data from Twitter and Facebook, and maybe depending on your use case with some weather data or some other external information. And out of that you can build the added value. So you have first to acquire your data so that you can prepare and analyze that, that's the first step. After that, the next step is then what's so-called data munching, or also data preparation, data transformation. In the end, the key really is to prepare your data so that you have it in a good shape to analyze it afterwards. And that's really a key step. And in most um, machine learning projects, data preparation and data acquisition take 60 to 70% of the complete project. So that's really a key. Before you have not prepared your data to have a good shape for analysis, your project will no, not be successful. And therefore, it's also so important though, that you understand your data. If you just start with technology, with Hadoop and Spark and TensorFlow, it will not help. You have to not have knowledge about your data and structure it the right way to analyze it. So, for example, you might remove some outliers here, or you might specifically take a look at outliers if you want to find out what's the problem or so. But the data has to be in the right shape. And then, after this, maybe 50% of the project time, you can start beginning analyzing the data. And for that, um, and that's really a, a key quote, it's from 1977, so very old, but very true for data analysis today. And it says, the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. And that's really also the key difference in contrary to things like business intelligence, where you create reports every week or every day. With machine learning and visual analytics, you really want to dig into the data to find new answers to questions. Not just reporting, it's about finding new answers to questions and get added value out of that. For that, you use things like um, brush-linked visual analytics, so a lot of different dashboards, but it's, again, you can dig into that, you can change parts of the data and ask new questions to that, and the tools are usually built in a way so that a business user can do it, because that's done by users who cannot develop. All right? That's the first step to analyze and understand your data. And then the second step, however, is because often the business user alone cannot find the answers because the data is too complex. And therefore, he works together with the data scientist who leverages advanced analytics and machine learning. For that, um, after we have prepared our data and visualized it a little bit, we have to build an analytic model. That's a machine learning model based on our historical data. And what I want to use here is a very simple example in the following, um, because that's better for understanding, even though in the real world it's much more complex. Um, but if you think about an analytic model and wonder here which one is the model, then the answer is both are a model, they are different models. It always specifically depends on which question do you ask and what do you think a model should do. But uh, in summary, a model is just a simplification of the truth and it helps you with decision making. So basically the motivation for machine learning and how I will show you in a use case afterwards is really that you help making better decisions in a data-driven way instead of using just a gut feeling. That's the main reason for it. Analyze all the big data sets because a human cannot do that and remove the gut feeling and make data-driven decisions. And for that, let's take a look at how to build an analytic model on a very simple example. This is a very simple formula here, and in the real world, as I said, if you do sensor analytics and fraud detection, it's more complex, but the principles are the same. And with, I have here one formula, and with this algorithm you see, it says, um, it, uh, first maybe the diagram, on the x-axis you have the emails an employee writes in a company, the number of emails, and on the y-axis you have the salary he gets. And with this formula you see, um, it says um, you earn 68 US dollar or euro plus 50 cent per email you write. And this, of course, um, everybody wants to work for this company, right? It's, it's clear, but we also see that this doesn't make any sense at all. Um, however, that's usually how machine learning models are built, because it's usually tougher than that in the use cases, and much tougher to analyze and validate if your model makes sense. And therefore, we have to improve the analytic model until it has some value for us, until it makes sense for us. In this case, I simply added a third attribute to this building this formula. And now we have a, a new formula out of that. And this formula makes more sense because now I show you the third attribute and that's the role of the employee. And now we see that the staff is earning less money than the manager, which makes, makes much more sense now. And if you take in more detail about the staff, then if, the, if you write more emails, you even earn less money. So don't write too many emails. And now we have a model which also really makes sense 
friends write to us, at least from our understanding point now. And now we are in a step, we have built a model and reworked it a little bit until it makes sense. And now we have to do a final validation in, in our model to think about can we deploy that to real time afterwards. And for that, um, here I have another example um, um, where the question we want to answer is how is the IQ of a kid related to the IQ of his or her mom? And here in this picture we see a lot of different stuff. It's a lot of complex stuff. And I, I'm a developer, I don't understand all of that. But the data scientist does. The, the key lesson here also is we do not have to understand everything of the machine learning model. We just have to apply it if it works for us. It's more or less a black box and returns probabilities for a specific prediction for us. And in this case, as business user or developer, I'm just interested in one visualization which I understand. And in this case, it shows us that what is important for the IQ of the kid, of course, it's the IQ of the mom. And also a little bit, it's the IQ of the mom's mom, right? But for example, it's not so important what the age of the mom is or what the mom works. So that, that's how you separate the important attributes from the not so important ones. And that's how you build models and validate them. And again, this is very simple examples. In the real world, you need much more experience to build these kind of analytic models. So that's the step how to build models. Let's talk a little bit about technologies here. So um, we have a lot of other talks. One was about TensorFlow before. We have a lot of talks about Apache Spark, for example, at this conference. And so there's many different tools and frameworks for that. Most of them are open source. And the, the key really is that they all have different benefits and also contrasts. So it's always a trade-off of which one to use. So for example, R, the first one, is really built for data scientists. So many of them love it. The same is true for Python, for example. We see that a lot of customers that they are playing around with that in their projects. But then on the other side, you also have to think about what do you want to do later with that. So after you have built the analytic model, you want to bring that to production. And here we see often that customers, they have built great analytic models with Python, and then they thought about how do we bring that to production, because then they had an Internet of Things use case with thousands of sensor events. And there, um, unfortunately, Python is not the right tool because it does not scale in a way that you can apply the analytic model in a, to thousands of events in a, a few seconds. And therefore, you can choose another one. I will show you afterwards a live demo where we used H2O, which is another open source framework by, uh, which leverages Hadoop and Spark, which is really built exactly for that use case to perform very well in nanoseconds, so, so really very fast. And so really the lesson learned here is there's a lot of frameworks and there's not the single sil silver bullet for all your use cases. And data scientists, when they have more and more experience, know exactly when to use which of these frameworks or at least which one to try out. Because often you try out different frameworks and simply take the one which works best for you. Because again, machine learning is more a black box after in the end. It predicts a result for you with a specific probability, and if it works for your use case, you use it. And how it works under the hood, that is not so important. However, besides that, that's really for the data scientist. And besides that, um, we see more and more tools for the business users. So data scientists are rare. We don't have many of them. And we want to use them in all the projects. That's not possible. So we see more and more tools. The analysts call that smart data discovery. So data discovery is what I showed before, visual analytics. You have visual tooling where the business user can play around and answer his questions. And smart data discovery means that there is also machine learning intelligence built into the tool so that the business user can leverage it without knowing what happens under the hood with machine learning. And I want to show you a few examples now um, how to build analytic models before we go over then to how to deploy that to real-time processing. So I go to my, uh, to my uh, Amazon machine. So here you see a visual analytics tool. And um, in this visual analytics tool, i just show you one example, um, as we just have 30 minutes for the talk. And this is one example where we have some historical data to find some, some insights and patterns in that. And one very good example is clustering. It's one kind of uh, machine learning algorithm which clusters a specific data set into um, different clusters. It's an unsupervised machine learning model. That means you do not, not need anything to know about the data before, and it clusters it for you. Use it for things like cross-selling, for example, for customer segmentation, to decide for which kind of a cluster do you want to send which coupon. Or if a specific cluster is good customers, which probably will not leave you, you do not send any coupon at all, because then you make more revenue out of that. And um, the key here really is that in this example, um, the business user 
could build this cluster without any kind of knowledge of technology behind that because these visual analytics tool, and that's what I mean with smart data discovery, they have built in machine learning models. And for example, one here is the k-means clustering. So that's an implementation of a, of a cluster uh, analytic model. And here, as business user, you just say, okay, here is my historical data with these columns attributes, and I want to build a cluster, let's say, for example, with five um, elements here, so that you build here your five uh, clusters. And then also you can change that here from five clusters to six or seven or eight. And then under the hood, the machine learning model is applied to you to show you a new cluster size and new clusters. So machine learning is running here under the hood without that you know what's going on or why. You just want to see the outcome. And if that works for you, you will apply that to your uh, other applications later. So that's the, the one part. That's when the business user works alone. That's perfect and it's getting better and better. These tools are getting much more machine learning and much smarter under the hood in the future. Um, but for many use cases, it's still not the thing to do because the use cases are too complex. The data set is too complex. And things like clustering or regression, that's just the beginning. There's much more you can do. And for that, you use other technologies. Um, for example, let's take a look here um, at... Um, at an R studio. And so um, the data scientists use usually the tool they want. Um, you cannot say to a data scientist, use this or that tool. They use whatever they want, a text editor, a specific IDE. In the end, we also do not care about that. We just want the final result, the analytic model. And here we, we see one example. Um, let's make it a little bit bigger, where um, it's about customer churn. And for this, we have a historical data set. And, for, and in this data set, um, we have a few things to do. First, we read the input data. And then, in the end, we can really apply an existing implementation of a machine learning model there. So in this case, I use R, one of the languages. And this has different implementations for clustering, for decision trees. And in this case, I'm using the GLM implementation. So this is really, as you can see here, just a method call. And under the hood, you have an implementation. And with that, you can use the historical data set of your customer to train this and build a new analytic model. In this case, um, we have decided that um, the churn is computed by using the frequency and the recency. This is two attributes out of hundreds we have about the customer. In this example, we use these two because we think this builds the best probability for us. And then afterwards, when we have built the analytic model, we can apply that to new data and see what it predicts for that. And let's take a look how that works. So um, I will first run the script here. Let me see. So let me let me make it smaller again. So I execute it all here and run this. And now um, it's it's executed the complete code and it has trained my model. It's very small data set, so it's very fast here. And now let's take a look at the data sets for you. Um, at the input data, at the current data, and the result data. I will also make it bigger again. So um, here we have our input data and the input, the input data here, here you see this is our input data. This is historical data. So for the historical data of customers and if they churned or not. So here you see the user ID and if he churned or not. Because for existing customers we know some left already and therefore is a one and some are still existing so it's a zero. That's our existing data set and with that we trained this model using the GLM implementation in this case. And then we want to apply this analytic model to new data. So this is our current data of existing customers where we do not know yet if they want to churn or not or if they will churn. And we use this model to this new data set to, to find out if they will churn. And if we do that we then did the result data and and here we have a new column on the left where you see the probability. And this is the prediction by this analytic model I've just built. And here it says, for example, some will churn with a probability by 99.9% .9 for whatever reason by this model. And therefore we can decide, okay, they will very probably leave, so we do not spend money on them. But others have, for example, 60 or 70% probability to leave. And here we can now decide, send them a few coupons, for example, so that they stay with us in going to go to the competitor. Right? And that's how you build analytic models. Another example is, um, let me just go back to make it bigger again. 
Um, another example is, for example, um, where we have many talks at this conference about Apache Spark. And here I use a notebook that's so-called in many of these kind of frameworks, where you can play around in a web browser and execute some kind of script with that. And um, again, in this case, I use, I use Scala and use the Scala um, language with Apache Spark under the hood to apply some kind of analytic model. So it's always the same steps. Because of time restrictions, I do not go into detail here. But you always, as I said in the data pipeline, access data, prepare it, and then you transform it or so, you analyze it, and then out of that you build an analytic model, and then you cross-validate it, and then you apply it afterwards. And what's really also the key now is that um, you build an analytic model as data scientist, but then when we come back to our visualization where the business user needs to understand it, and he needs to approve that this model works for his use case, um, there you have to integrate it here. So either the visual analytics tool has enough options so that you can use it alone for intelligent stuff, or if not, there is also the option that you can integrate any kind of machine learning into that. So in this case, I have um, one example here. And um, here I have some data functions, again with R, um, where I integrate an, an R script here into the visualization. So here you see it's a very small R script, which again uses the k-means clustering, an implementation of the cluster functionality. And I simply, as parameters, I give my data in, and as output I get the different clusters. And that's how you can integrate any kind of technology in the visualization. Um, so here, in this kind of example, I actually have integrated the R script. So here, when I change from six clusters to seven, under the hood, it uses the R code and the analytic model to recompute and decide what's now the new cluster and how should it look like. And that's how the business user and the data scientist work together to apply any kind of technology under the hood, but under the same visualization to build an analytic model and validate it until it works for you. And that's the first step. And now um, let's come to the second step, um, that is applying that to real-time processing. So, because as I said before, it's important after you have found the insights and built the analytic models, you have to apply them because otherwise it doesn't help much because then the fraud still happens again and you can't cross-sell and so on. And therefore what you do here, and that's the part where the role is usually the developer who applies the analytic model. Here you use some kind of event processing or stream processing or streaming analytics. Um, there's a lot of different terms for that, but in the end what it means is that you process the data while it is hot. And that's in contrary to the traditional data processing where you do request response. So in the past, when we wrote Java code and so on, we usually also had web services and databases, and then we requested some information from a database and we get it back. Request response via SOAP or REST or Java code or whatever. And if you want to really correlate the information in real time, then you use what I call a streaming analytics. And that's really process the data while is it in motion, while it is hot, before the fraud happened or before the customer has left the store, before the machine broke. You apply that in real time. In parallel, you can still um, store it to the database, of course, but you have to process the data while it is hot. That's the key difference, and that's also a few new concepts you have to use and new frameworks. Um, for that, you have a processing pipeline for real-time processing, um, where you have stream ingestion. So first, you get the streams of real-time data, then you pre-process it with filtering, transformation, and then also, as one part here, you apply the analytic model for every single new event in your streaming pipeline. And as I have not so much more time, I cannot go into much more detail. Um, there's a lot of frameworks here. Um, for example, we have other talks here about Apache Flink and Apache Spark Streaming and Apache Apex. That's this kind of frameworks for that. And on the other side, you also have products for this. If you want to get just more about an overview about that, I also have a talk later at, uh, I think, 3.30 or so today, where I compare this and give a little more detailed introduction into stream processing and the different frameworks and cloud solutions and products and so on. But due to time restrictions, um, I cannot go into more detail here, but really here, the key is that you apply the machine learning model which you have trained before and apply that to real-time processing. Um, in this case, I'm not using a framework, but a tool which has visual coding um, instead of writing Java code or so for that. 
And on top of that, we also have a live UI where you can see the streaming events because often the human should be the, the person who makes the last decision. If you think about things like fraud detection or if you think about predictive maintenance, often um, even if you think it's 80% clear that the part will break and you replace it, it's still very expensive. So we have customers like airlines and oil uh, platforms and so on. If you replace one part, it's still 100,000 euro. And therefore, a human has the last decision here. It's called augmented intelligence. So we do not want to replace humans with, with, with machine learning. We want to make them more intelligent with that. And so, the relation to stream processing now, we build our analytic model, and, and that's really one of the, if you go out with one lesson learned, the key lesson learned is if you build your analytic model, you have to reuse the same analytic model without redevelopment and apply that to your real-time processing engine. Because we have seen customers which have built an analytic model with one technology, but it was not ready for building that into real-time production and scaling it out or for good performance and so on. And for that, it's really important to talk together in the beginning with the whole team, including the developer and including the data scientist, what's our outcome at the end, what do we want to do with that. And so, um, again, I use a tool here um, where I apply our, um, in this case, H2O analytic model to our streaming process. If you use a framework like Apache Spark or Storm or Apex or so, you write the code in the end and apply the model. Um, but key really is to apply the same model. And so, this is the two steps we do. We build the model and we apply that to real time. And now let's also take a short look at how, about how that looks in a project in the real world. Here, um, let's think about um, a project we did for a manufacturer in an assembly line. And in this assembly line, um, in every station you see, um, it costs you money to do work on the part before you move it to the next station. And sometimes you even have to put it back and do rework, and it's all expensive. And what we wanted, had to do here, we had to do reduce costs by, an, uh, by building and applying an machine learning model in real time to every single new event. So every part, in every station is an event, and we apply the analytic model in every single station to decide do we scrap the part or not, based on the probability which is um, computed by the analytic model. From the architecture perspective, um, we have here an Hadoop cluster where we have historical data sets. With that big data sets, we build the analytic model, in this case with our visual analytics tools and H2O, which is under the hood Hadoop and Spark, and we then deployed that model to real-time processing, to our streaming analytics engine. And with that then, we applied that to every single new event which is coming in. And so let's also take a look. Um, I only have five minutes left, so this is only a 35-minute talk, unfortunately. Um, Let's also take a look at how that works, and therefore um, a short look into our um, visual development environment. So um, again, I will go into more detail that in my other talk, how to implement that and so on. Um, but here, um, the key really is for this talk, um, one part of this process is the H2O model, which we apply here in our component. And actually, really, this is um, reusing the existing model, so we do not redevelop anything. In the end, usually an analytic model is some kind of binary file or so, or string and you apply that to your event process. And in this case, the example is already running. So um, let me go to my debug and start or, or um, increase the feed speed. So I have here historical data where I feed in new streams to simulate it now. And to better visualize it, let's go to our visualization tool here. Um, and here now you'll see, um, for every single new event which is coming into the station, we have all this streaming process, including transformation of an XML file, including filtering, aggregation, all the streaming parts. And then one small part of that is applying the H2O model to each single event here. And so here in blue you see all the events where the analytic model decided we will continue with that, move it from station 1 to station 2 and to station 3. But also there's the yellow ones. The yellow ones are the ones which are scrapped because our machine learning model decided that we will scrap them because then it's better for reducing costs, throw this one away. And this one is really applied to every single new event. And you can imagine in this use case we have a lot of events. And therefore it was also important um, to to, to um, do it in a performant way. Um, I have some br um, display issues here. Let's see if this works. Yes, this is better. Um, and so here um, at the at the bottom. Oh no, it's this way. It's not working. Let's go back this way. 
So we have, here we have another visualization, and this is just for measurement to demonstrating that. And here, um, the key really is for every single stream process, including transformation, filtering, aggregation, and applying the model, in average, this process takes around 3.4 milliseconds. And applying the analytic model takes, in this case, 0.22 milliseconds. Or in another example, it takes 0.23 milliseconds or 0.25. So you see, this is really very fast, and that's needed for Internet of Things manufacturing, where you have a lot of events. And based on what you want to do here in the production in real time, you have to decide in the beginning which technology to use. If you use R or Python or something like H2O, for example. That's really trade-off. What do you want to do and what you want to um, bring in production later? And that's how you bring this analytic model to real-time processing afterwards. And with that, um, let's go back to the slides. So we have two minutes left, so just for the conclusion. Takeaways. Um, insights are hidden in historical data. That's really the start to starting part. Um, you have to find the patterns first, because otherwise, um, what do you want to do in production later? That's the first part. And therefore, the stored data is usually in Hadoop or a NoSQL database, or maybe even in CSV files. We also have that at customers. But it is somewhere. And then we have to analyze it. And if it's more in complex data, we leverage machine learning. Like I've showed you in the beginning, the computer has to learn for that. We cannot program everything by if-else. Um, clauses. And then the final step is to apply that to real-time processing and therefore the key lesson learned really is without redevelopment because then you have to cycle twice with building and testing and validating a model. And that's basically the story from building an analytic model and also deploying that to real-time processing. And that's it. As I said, I also have another talk where I go into more detail about stream processing at 3.30 or 3.40 where I show the open source frameworks, cloud services and products and so on in more detail. And as this is only a 35-minute session instead of 40 minutes, um, if you have questions, please come to me to the front. And otherwise, enjoy. I think we are at lunchtime now. Thanks a lot. <laughs>